Welcome back. The January 6th committee is planning at least two more hearings this week. On Friday, former White House counsel Pat Cipollone testified before the committee for seven hours on President Trump's efforts to overturn the election. This week's first hearing will focus on Mr. Trump's connections to various extremist groups that were involved in the attack. And it's being led by Democrats Jamie Raskin and Stephanie Murphy. And Congresswoman Murphy, a Democrat from Florida, joins me now. Congresswoman, welcome to Meet the Press. Great to be with you. Let me start with Pat Cipollone's testimony. Was it as critical uh, as you thought it would be? Of course it was. He had relevant information about what was happening in the White House. And we are really grateful to him that he was willing to come before the committee and share that with us. You know, of course, there were areas in which he uh, claimed privilege, but it was important for us to understand what the president's top legal advisor uh, thought about the activities that were happening uh, post-election and in the run-up to January 6th. Can you give me an idea of what he would not touch? He claimed privilege on conversations um, that related to the advice he provided directly to the president or conversations with the president. But I think we still got a lot of relevant information from him. And it provides us another perspective on what was happening in the White House in those weeks running up to January 6th that were so critically important. I've seen some reports, other fellow committee members said Mr. Cipollone did not contradict previous witnesses. Did he confirm testimony that Cassidy Hutchinson gave? I think there was a lot of information that fit into this bigger puzzle that we're putting together. And we have different voices telling about the same meeting and, and more or less telling the same narrative. Of course, you have to understand these are all folks who have had a year plus mm -hmm. since the events. And so everybody has a different level of memory or recall on spe specific details. But the overall message that we have been gathering out of all of these witnesses is that the president knew he had lost the election or um, that his advisors had told him he had lost the election okay. um, and that he was casting about for ways in which he could retain power and remain um, the president despite the fact that the democratic will of the american people was to have uh, president biden be the next elected was it clear that the president was told his actions that he wanted to take were illegal I think he was given the best possible advice by very talented uh, legal folks, both from Barr at the Department of Justice as well as uh, within the White House in uh, legal counsel. And they gave him very strong advice. What we were able to ascertain from those folks is what their activities were, what mm -hmm. they said. And as you have seen in some of the hearings, they said in no uh, unclear terms that these were things that these were lines that could not be crossed for the sake of democracy. Can you confirm if he said, we're going to get charged with every crime imaginable? I mean, that was a big, important moment in Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. Were you able to have him confirm that that is a concern he had? We were able to get him to confirm the concerns that he did have, uh, his reservations about some of the things that were happening, his desire not to be affiliated with, uh, you know, some of the things, his desire to be on the record, have not the... Not affiliated legal... with what? When you say some of the things, the well, speech, like the ellipse? Well, the speech at the ellipse. Okay. He didn't attend the speech at the ellipse. Um, there were... Did he try to get language struck out of it? He, um, you know, not to get too much in the details, I think for legal counsel, they um, participated and they can uh, perform the role that they have when speeches do come to them. The Jeffrey Clark uh, uh, scheme, mm -hmm. it was referred to that he called that a murder-suicide pact. Was he, were you able to get that confirmed out of him? He made very clear that he thought um, the Eastman uh, theory, which was this idea that the vice president could sa somehow unilaterally declare uh, the president, the president-elect, or that um, the pressure on the Department of Justice, uh, he sided with the Department of Justice on their findings mm -hmm. of no fraud in the election. He made very clear that he took the side of many of the folks that you've already seen come before the committee and was asserting that there wasn't enough evidence to prove that the election was not free and fair and that, you know, the right thing to do, I think, uh, for a democracy is to have a peaceful transfer of power, especially after December 14th, when the states have certified uh, their electors.
One of the more striking uh, responses to supposedly things that Mr. Cipollone said was from Jared Kushner. It's a clip we've seen a lot. I want to play it. I know that, you know, he was always, him and the team were always saying, oh, we're going to resign. We're not going to be here if this happens, if that happens. So I kind of took it up to just be whining, to be honest with you. Number one, did Mr. Cipollone have any reaction to this idea that his threats for resignation were just simply chalked up to whining? I think when you um, look at legal advice that's given um, because you have to understand, Mr. Cipollone wanted to see um, President Trump succeed. Mm -hmm. And so he was giving him the best legal advice he could to ensure his success. And if he got to a place where he felt like he couldn't morally uh, stand by some sort of action, resigning isn't an act of whining. It is a ultimate protest that what that his advice was being ignored and what the president moved forward with was something he didn't want to be associated with. So I'm not sure that I would have characterized it as whining. Let's go to your hearing on Tuesday. Number one, are we going to see much of Mr. Cipollone's testimony on Tuesday or this or then the first hearing this week? We are always receiving new information from a lot of different sources, and we are trying to um, pull the information that the American people most need to hear. And I imagine that you will be hearing things from uh, Mr. Cipollone, but also from others that were in the White House. The focus of this next hearing will be on the domestic violent extremists, as well as members of Congress, people that the president called in to assist him in this pressure campaign. And this pressure campaign is a follow on to the previous hearings where we talked about how the president pressured the vice president, pressured the Department of Justice, pressured state election and electors mm -hmm. uh, um, to just call the race in his favor. And he, um, in the waning days um, leading up to January 6th, called in additional support. Congressman Raskin has called it convergence. These groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and what they were doing here, they wouldn't be here without the president wanting him here. But are you going to be able to provide evidence that's more than just convergence, that there was a, an absolute understanding as to why the president invited them to Washington? Without uh, spoiling anything that um, comes uh, this week and encouraging folks to tune in to the specifics, what I will say is that we will lay out the body of evidence that we have that talks about how the president's tweet mm -hmm. on the wee hours of December 19th of Be There, Be Wild was a siren call. Mm -hmm. um, to these folks. Um, and we'll talk in detail about what that caused them to do, how that caused them to organi organize, as well as who else was amplifying that message. And you have s evidence of specific members of Congress were somehow involved in, in amplifying and encouraging these groups to come? Yes, I think all of that is pretty public. They were quite public um, mm -hmm. about their uh, efforts to amplify the president's call um, to use January 6 as a last stand in this effort to remain as president. Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, appreciate you coming in. So great to be with you. All right, we'll be watching this week. Thanks. When we come back, is President Biden the Democrats' best bet in 2024? Panel is next.